He just kind of like, mm-hmm. Good evening, viewer, and welcome to my dungeon. I'm Captain Stack, and you're listening to Let's Bandy About. With me is my humble servant. I'm Ladeus. <laughs> is that your, is that your internet <laughs> sure. alter ego? All right, from now you, on, Ed will be known on the internet as Amadeus. I mean, you were talking in a foppish voice. I felt like I had to join in. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we are playing. Oh, t- why don't you introduce what we're playing, Ed? Your um, this being is attacked. the spiritual successor to Peter Molyneux's Dungeon Keeper 2, otherwise known as War for the Overworld. And in my opinion, my humble, dearest opinion, I think it far outshines Peter Molyneux's hot garbage. Yeah, well, you know, as I was saying earlier, Peter Molyneux has never made a balanced game in his life, so uh, it's not surprising that somebody could take his great concept and then turn it into something actually decently designed. Um, I just like the the visual experience here here is so much better. And also just whoever, like, the magical voice man that narrates right. this game. <laughs> the narrator is um, returning. He played the the voice of the Keeper slash narrator in Dungeon Keeper 2. I actually don't know if it... So I was going to mention Dungeon Keeper 1. Minions are fighting the enemy. I never is played. technologically and graphically considerably worse than this or Dungeon Keeper 2. But it's like Windows 91. Like it's, well, it's actually a DOS game. Don't <laughs> fuck. Although it was also on Windows, so I always played the Windows version. But... You know, I just, uh, I always liked that version a bit better, even though it was way. even worse in its design, because there's something about the, like, visual and the um, graphics and the audio on that one that really did a good job making your uh, lair feel more like a, I don't know, like a beehive of activity. Yeah. These ones it's just, like, a moving little. colors around the screen. Yeah, these ones are like always a little stilted and, uh... More pigments than figments. Yeah, well, it, it has more of a, like, consistently gray-brown color palette, and it just, um, the audio had so much more, like, kind of just silence, and it made everything sound big and hollow, which maybe was part of the goal, but the other one felt, you know, kind of just, like, brimming with activity, like you were, you know, close to the geological core of the earth or something. <laughs> um, yeah, in, in this game, your specific geospatial depth is indeterminate. Yeah. Um, so, for those of you who aren't familiar with this series, is that it's uh, it was sort of a reimagining of the dungeon crawler, where instead of uh, invading the dungeon, you would play as the bad guy. So you're the dungeon keeper, and your dungeon is invaded by heroes. Um, and it always has had kind of a, like, I guess I would say, your sardonic sense of humor to enemy. it. Especially um, with your exceedingly foppish narrator. Right, right. So, um, yeah, I mean, Peter Mullen has always kind of done that fantasy comedy thing, I guess, fairly decently. Um, did well, So did you play any Peter Molyneux games besides the Dungeon Keeper series? Um, I don't think so. I think, like, but around the did, time I was... I, a little bit of Fable. Oh, God, that game. <laughs> um, I like Fable. I, I heard about Black and White, which might have been another one of his enterprises. I could be wrong about that. That No, that is one of his. That, I played the shit out of that when I was a kid. Yeah, so I heard about that around this time as well, but I never ended up getting into it for one reason or another. But I heard it, similar stories about that game, and that people, many people, felt as though it sh- should be better than it is. I feel like that's a common theme among Peter Molyneux games: is that cool. people can innately sense the potential, but regretful that it doesn't quite exist yet. He, I mean, he has a bad habit of promising the world and then delivering like semi-decent games. I don't. I mean. So I have a lot of fond memory of Peter Molyneux games. Oh, um, don't get me wrong, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> I think they appeal very strongly to children who don't have much discerning tastes in the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't know. I always thought that his games Unleash had... Your hounds to tear the flesh know, from these even though they were full of, like, kind of 
questionable design decisions. I, I always felt like they were built with a fair amount of passion, but I also, and I said this in my recording with John because we were playing Fable 2, but um, no, I always felt that Peter Molyneux had, had great first games that were always very creative and like they were full of a lot of a lot of love and and creativity but then he would just get bored of his project and by the second one it was like he had just Your minions are uh, fighting really the started to phone it in because I really felt that way about Dungeon Keeper well Dungeon Keeper 2 was his best sequel for sure but, yeah but the, like what a sequel should be like an improvement over the previous Right, and like a lot of the ways in which I complain about it. What's the way to call all my creatures to? So fight? you go. So those like cross swords on the left hand side. It's like literally the biggest button. Yeah, that. So you click on that, and various different squares on the map. See, in Dungeon Keeper, that was a spell. So I was looking at my spell book. Yeah, I think the utility buttons in this game are like far better mm -hmm. organized. No, I mean, yeah, there was really no reason for that to be a spell. I mean, so. As you might be able to tell, because I've just basically been scrolling around and not really doing that much playing wise. This is a very like on micro e management type of game. It's it's like not a strategy game. It's, it's they called it they called the genre god games, I guess. I mean, that's like kind of like the the kind of paces this kind of game. You're like always paranoid that some shit's happening that you're not the, entirely aware of. Right, right, like just off screen. You know, somebody is slaughtering half of your base. Yeah. Yeah. Which is always, I don't know, I always thought that was part of the your fun of it. It was just sort of like, that, it's your job to be on top of it, you know? It's your fault. You're the one with, the, you're the boss. <laughs> um, and I always just thought that workers, Peter Molyneux just must, like, fantasize about being a large, a large hand that can, like, you know, slap people and pick them up. That's he wishes to be a more proactive, invisible yeah. hand. Maybe this is why his games never quite live up to their potential. This is just how he manages his office. <laughs> <laughs> Work faster! Slap! He's just living vicariously through his video games. I mean, he does have a reputation as, like, a bit of an asshole. <laughs> not, like, not, it, he's just an unintentional asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so we're Michael what was the like inventor of capitalism um, Adam Smith so oh. we're like Adam Smith is like like I a philosopher am the invisible hand <laughs> yeah where Adam Smith is like the philosopher Peter Mullen who is like God a larper Our concept of being, being a hero in Fable would just be about fucking everybody else over, <laughs> and everyone would be like, "Wow, look at this this person that you know society is just holding back. I want him to be able to fuck more people over." I feel like Dungeon Keeper series would be far more like anarchist in nature. <laughs> <laughs> the inspiration was Anne Rand. <laughs> so Peter you're, Molyneux's like incredibly flawed interpretation of Anne <laughs> <laughs> this is what he thinks she meant. <laughs> I mean, that's what I mean. Like, where Adam Smith is the philosopher, Peter Molyneux would be the LARPer. <laughs> <laughs> the LARP philosopher. <laughs> he just role plays the philosopher. He wants to be the invisible hand. <laughs> well, it sounds like it's not, it's not a far cry away from that. Uh, I mean, you were literally controlling these creatures with a goddamn hand. <laughs> <laughs> that they aren't entirely aware of. <laughs> I feel like there's fairly conclusive evidence right now. <laughs> but yes, this game can be quite ponderous in nature, and you end up being like, alright, I'm secure. Time to fuck over the enemy. Yeah, well, like, what's happening over, over here right now? Nothing. Oh, I thought I saw red on the mini map. Oh, that's what like this the glittering things. Those yeah. are, uh, the rainbow areas are shrines of some sort. Ah, uh, okay, well let's, uh, put a little bit of that Eye of God on it. Yeah. Is this what? Oh, no, it's a little further this, oh, this thing. Oh, wait, we were trying to get this thing. How do I get this? Do I have to surround it or something? Um, uh, yeah, you can, I think you already own that, actually. Oh. Because you're... Is that a portal? 
Yeah, but... Underworld gateway, okay. It's surrounded by your tiles, so I don't think it's like a thing. Oh, okay. You have to realize. And what do you think is in this thing over here? Let's... I have gone. Oh, that's a, it's a that's a, a siege, siege shrine, shrine, I believe. Don't we already have one of those? You can get more, multiple of them. All right. Um, let's call some. Well, let's see what's going on over here. Actually, it looks like this is where we're trying to kill. Yeah, let's I mean, keep going that way. I mean, this game definitely caters to the completionist archetype. Like what? It's, it's like you must explore everything and cover the entire map with your tiles and create all the things and create the most aesthetically yes. pleasing dungeon before you even even approach the enemy. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's like somewhat sandboxy in that way. I mean, it's definitely what I do yeah. <laughs> I play this game. Well, and so you bought this like maybe, I don't we bought this at the same time maybe like a year or so ago. Yeah. And like I didn't have a computer that could actually run it, so I just didn't really touch it. You got pretty into it. Did, did you beat this game? Yeah, I beat it. How, I mean, how? it's like one of the few games that are, I don't know, I, I ended up going for kind of like not very high learning curve games a lot of times. No, I totally feel you on that. Because I, then I don't feel the need to cheat yeah, and when, I, well, during the well, game. I, and so like, I, I, gra go ahead. I gradually just get like immersed in the game. And this is definitely one of those, like I never felt compelled to cheat, to, like get ahead in this game. Right, yeah. I mean, I, I like games that have smaller scope, but like a higher degree of, of polish. I basically never play AAA games anymore because they always are just such like... Shit shows. Well, they're just like really bloated. Like, I just want to throw a little bit of everything into them. And like, yeah, I don't know. I guess sort of like the default game these days seems to be the sort of Assassin's Creed sandbox in various different settings. And yeah. Such a large portion of those games seems to be just sort of like running around. Run around. Just run around. Yeah, I get the, the same feeling. I remember when Bioshock and Assassin's Creed first came out in the same year. And it kind of like seemed like this golden age of console well, gaming. Yeah, well, you know what else was that year was Mass Effect. Oh, uh, yeah. It was like the no, beginning of like the first three like humongous like titles. Yeah, I, I remember thinking that both... Bioshock and Mass Effect were masterpieces when they came out, but it's like, since then, it seems like such little progress has been made since then. Yeah, I remember- I just think making, I, like, bigger sandboxes and slightly better facial animations on Commander Shepard's stubble. Yeah, I feel- I completely feel the same way, because I was very impressed that year with- just the quality of the titles that came out. Like, I was very excited about well, everything. Well, they were all new franchises at the time, too, so you had, like, I know, it was three like a, wildly it's, different franchises it was of super high quality. It wasn't just, like, a breath of fresh air. It was, like, a hurricane of fresh air. <laughs> well, because before and, like, that, we had been stuck in, like, basically Halo first person. Like, Halo, and maybe, to some extent, Call of Duty. I don't quite remember the timeline on this, but I remember for a long time, every game just was, like, dripping with Halo envy. Oh yes, I do remember that time. I remember playing like multiple Xbox games with my friend. And it was basically Halo and or some weird shit we picked up at Blockbuster. <laughs> like, so what platform were you on? I guess it must have been on Xbox. Yeah, it was Xbox. It was, or Xbox 360. It's way back when, when the Xbox 360 was like a new console. <laughs> right. Which, I, like, I don't know, was 2004? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Boy, yeah, that console generation very long. Which is kind of shocking, really, when you think about it. But yeah, I... Are afraid to speak their minds around it's, you I think all. console... I think video games has progressed very well in the last decade. Yeah, I mean, I like, for the there's, most part, there's been, there's been a lot of really good trends. I like the roguelike trend, of course. Like, I, I think we've all become picky bastards in many ways with video games. Because I still... I can... I didn't really have discerning taste way back when, but I do remember like the 2000s for like computer gaming, like the early 2000s when like everything was sold by CD. It was just a giant pain in the ass acquiring new computer games. Well, yeah, I mean, in, in that way the infrastructure has changed a ton. But like the, I mean, the quality of the games then weren't like that varied, and then like console games were also well, you know, like, I, curious. I think it comes and goes in cycles because I remember, I actually, it, it's funny, maybe it's on like sort of a five-year-on, five-year-off thing or something, because 
I remember around the late 90s, but before the sort of mid-aughts. Um, the mid-aughts? You call it by the aughts? I don't know. I find that incredibly like British. I got called on a, out on that recently as well. Payday is probably <laughs> Anyway, the point... I, I will judge you for, like, impersonating the well, British. Well, probably you. <laughs> <laughs> You're the only person that notices or cares. <laughs> but anyway... I, I've been told by my coworkers, like, my friend designer that I, like... She feels like she has to give like fair warning to my coworkers because I will be that person that will like point out like the <laughs> things that are like two pixels off. <laughs> be like, fix this. This is inconsistent. <laughs> Ooh, there's another. Oh, blue, right? Blue and white. Anyway, um, no, yeah. Around the late '90s, you had a lot of my favorite games come out, um, and it did feel like there was some genuine creativity in games. Um, you know, around games like. Diablo and MDK and you you know that was sort of the golden age of real time strategy um, so I think there was a lot going on then but then it seemed like in the early 2000s pardon me not the aughts um, yeah things got really really lame in first person shooter I remember when it was like you could go to an entire shelf at the game store and it would all be World War 2 shooters oh my god I remember hating that actually yeah. When I was a kid, because I was like, I don't want this bullshit. I want like my like yeah, I Age of Empires. Fly around in space. <laughs> anyway, I do think things are better now. The indie market's really good right now. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, and that's actually a good uh, little little transition there into one of our topics as we are going to talk about what we've been playing lately. So, you were talking Your earlier about Rise of the Risen. What was it called? Regions of Ruin. Regions of Ruin. Rising. Where, 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 where you make the Dwarven Kingdom great again. Ah, <laughs> we are going to dig a wall. <laughs> um, it is actually about, like, rehabilitating a settlement and pushing back the alien, like, orcs and goblins. Okay, so, so like, what kind of game is it exactly? So... It has roguelike elements where you start out and you are like kind of a free agent in many ways and you go to like levels and you don't really know what's going to happen until you arrive and you kind of have to adapt but it also contains like strategy elements in that you aren't committed to that level like you can leave and come back to it if you feel like oh shit I am unprepared for this um, so I like the unexpected aspect it keeps discovery aspect high because like truly I've felt like every level has been unique enough in its own way that it make, keeps me curious and they're generated procedurally it's a roguelike um I don't think it's generated procedurally because I think that'd be a lot to ask for I think a new studio so what's roguelike about it um I get the same impression of a roguelike at least on the first playthrough because it has taken quite a many of hours getting where I am now Does that, that like it's like I don't know what's coming so it, I don't think it's procedurally generated but it like encompasses enough of the same unexpected aspects of roguelikes that I compare it as such you okay. cannot I, store more gold um, but yeah it, it's, it's a slow drip story there's a story to it which I enjoy I think I require that in every game that I play mm -hmm. um, it is a the story is mostly about your character rebuilding the Dwarven Kingdom and pushing back the, the orcs and goblins that infested its ruins, hence the regions of ruin storyline. Mm -hmm. But there's also like the Diablo 2 grind aspect to it, I think, that the people oh, really Everyone's favorite part of Diablo 2. Yeah, which I think a lot of people can look at skeptically, but I think if it's done correctly, as an imbalanced really well, which requires a lot of fucking work to do. Uh -huh. It can actually be rather fun. I mean, I played the shit out of Diablo 2. It was, I mean, I was only being somewhat sarcastic. It was my favorite part of Diablo 2, but it was also my least favorite part and why I stopped. Yeah. So, uh, as a side tangent, to get into that shrine, you have to use a construct. It's that brown diamond thing. It's a... Construct, a brown diamond. Ah... Yeah, the underminer. So you have to put it right next to that brimstone wall. So you have to claim those things. So you, you need to put like an imp rally banner right, right there. Worker rally. 
Get to work. Uh, I put him to claim the thing. Anyway. So, there's like an item. This is the same sort of grind system that is existent in World of Warcraft and Blizzard games in general. It has like a ranking and item rareness and what have you, but. They keep it like going forward enough that I like it. It makes me looking forward to like protecting my character and like reclaiming these fallen dwarven regions. And the, hu the humor is nice. Oh, there's a little aspects of humor in it that I enjoy. Yeah, I imagine a bit like this game. Yeah, and I think what I'm liking about it recently is that it's kind of mindless in some respects and I'm able to play it without too much thought. That's, I feel that way about a lot of games. I mean, as uh, people who know that this series was inspired by Let's Drown Out, Yafti would often talk about how much he likes podcast games, which is something I also like. Um, yeah, so like, I don't know, Subnautica was kind of good in that way, FTL is good in that way, a lot of a lot of games that actually would be good for this series are good in that way, where you can just play it while listening to a podcast and not feel like you're losing yeah. too much of either. It actually would be pretty good for that, now that I think about it. Yeah, I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's not going to teach anything about yourself. <laughs> That's I, a pretty high high standard to hold games to. But I I think it's a standard worth holding games to. Yeah, well, what's the game that taught you something about yourself? Uh, are full of go. Journey. I still really need to play that. I think that is what a video game to a, what a video game can aspire to. Yeah. I think it, video games can actually reach the level of genuine art. Yeah, it, well, as I mean, a reflective mirror. So you have to initiate the underminer if it's built. Oh, I see. You so to, it's just like left. I don't know if it's built yet, but you just like click on it. There you go. Uh, oh, no, you have to. Underminer like complete. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah, um, but yeah, Journey... Oh no, my eye is gonna... Don't okay. worry about it. <laughs> There's plenty of these things. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, like, they'll, they'll come back, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Journey is what I think of video game as art. Yeah, well that was part of that whole cavalcade of really good, like, arty indie games, like, uh, uh, Bastion and Great, Limbo, they were all coming out around that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that was kind of the one on the PlayStation, so I never really got to play it, but. Um, I mean, it, it was it was a beautiful Sunday afternoon that I played. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can play it in like a day or so, right? Yeah. It yeah. is. I need to borrow somebody's PS3 so I can just play through that. It ha literally has no narrative or words in it. Like, there's no like written or linguistic experience to it. And they manage to communicate a very emotional but experience. You say it best when you say nothing at all. Is that like an 80s song? It is. Oh. So sweet of you to notice. That's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> like most things from the 80s. Yeah. <coughs> it's try to get as much of that cough into the mic as you can. <laughs> Excuse me! <laughs> um. Death comes for us all eventually. Ah, your first patrol. You can organize a war rally close to them. Well, these guys look like they have it under control. I only sent them to take care of the trap, but you've already only sent your like goddamn nightmare creatures to like attack them. Cthulhu monster plus like <laughs> alien spider, like zerglings. The enemy just all. In instantly goes mad. I mean, I would. <laughs> I don't know about you, oh, but... This is their day job. <laughs> Jesus They're Christ. just, like, calling calling home, being like, I'm not gonna be at dinner tonight. Oh my god. <laughs> what a horrifying day job. <laughs> like, you are, like, trapped in, like, a, a sunlightless, like, dungeon and virtually encountering tentacle monsters. So you definitely do damage to your own creatures by slapping them. Yes, but they'll fight harder. It'll just train them into pain. Yes. You know of another way. Um, you can possess them. 
assume total control. Oh, okay, control. Let's, let's, let's assume direct control a little bit. I haven't tried that in this one. So it's, <laughs> it's the invisible hand. Possession, yes. It's, it's, the, this, it's the Peter Molyneux iconography. Oh my god. I know, yeah, left click and right click. Pay your minions, Underlord. Uh, I think. They're friendly fire. You do get it in like an attack menu on the bottom part, but I've yeah, never. Yeah, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so I can use numeric keys. Yeah, I just never found it particularly useful. It's, you always. Do I have a reason that you should take possession of uh, I don't want to be this guy anymore. <laughs> Let's do. <laughs> I know, it's three. always like a horrifying experience when yeah, you're well, like. I mean, that was always one of the cool things about this series, was like. I'm a monster. I can't do you ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. I'm so <laughs> I'm ugly and I'm proud. <laughs> Lamp, what he calls I'm it. <laughs> I'm ugly and I'm proud. <laughs> I'm at ugly it. and I'm proud. Look at it! <laughs> Alright, I don't know how to fight with this thing. <laughs> Exposition later, just like a crowd screaming at the movie <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it looks like this situation's been taken care oh my of. God. That's something I need to do. I need to bring in more, like, Spongebob quotes into my work. <laughs> <laughs> Identify who's it's the true believer. A, a shared language of our generation. Oh my goodness, it really is. I have tried referencing Spongebob to people who... Even, like, a little bit older than us and they don't get it. Or even a little bit younger. And younger? Most... That's surprising. I See, so my experience has been that... We're on the upper end of the SpongeBob generation. That's surprising. Well, I, I actually think that. Also, you can get rid of that worker rally. Oh, yes. You, you can just slap it. Just, just slap. No, slap. Right click. There you go. Yeah, you need, and, the, and there's the other one as well. Oh, you can have more than one. Yes. How strange. This and game is the so advanced compared to Dungeon Keeper. That one. Yes. But yeah, SpongeBob. I always feel like whenever someone I talk to has said they don't watch Spongebob, I always feel as though they're a little Your bit less intelligent. In yeah, just just didn't get Spongebob. Yeah, and I realize that's like a snobbish view of mine, but I genuinely think that like a certain appreciation for themes of insanity and like body horror as humor well, I, indicates I like a certain... Because sort of, everybody, pretty much everybody watched Spongebob, right? But if you didn't get Spongebob, it meant that, like, if Your you didn't, vaults cannot store any more gold. if you just thought that it was like, I guess, Spongebob having an annoying voice and Patrick being stupid, then it just meant that, like, you missed a lot of what was clearly there. Yes, you, you couldn't perceive, you weren't perceptive enough to understand Spongebob. Right, which, in all fairness, for most people probably came from just, like, immediately judging it, like, at its cover. And also, I suppose, like, again, we are, like, the upper, the upper crust of the yeah, Spongebob well, and generation. Also, because if you, and if you like, didn't uh, catch it in seasons one through three, you really didn't see Spongebob, because that was the only, that, the only Spongebob that matters is in the first three seasons. And also, like, when we encountered it at first, it was, like, what, when we were ten, or something like that. I mean, it's true. Uh, I think it was probably even before that, I remember being in, like, first or second grade when it was like first being promoted on Nickelodeon. Which is amazing for like a show around the time because I've definitely watched like trashier television oh from the God. time and it's like I Very watch Very little it. holds up from that <laughs> yeah. like age demographic and that time period. Yeah, I've definitely like, tried rewatching television like, series from the time and watch, like regret. Try to watch more than two episodes of Fairly Odd Parents. Like, oh good, God. Good it's like we all have fond memories of Fairly Odd Parents. At the but time we tried, I tried watching Pokemon with you, and I was like, I want to see. Oh my god! <laughs> and it was just like terrible. <laughs> just like I need to see the horror. <laughs> yeah, that show. It's. And I I remember thinking Family Guy, after that point, was like a step up in terms of humor. But that it was just like me being uneducated. Just a trick of the light. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's all smoke and mirrors. There, there is, I, I think there's something to Family Guy. I always would point out that it's, um... But I think there's all... I'm just saying that just because there's something to the Family Guy doesn't mean there's a whole lot of something. The... 
the thing that I noticed about Family Guy was it always seemed to be exactly what I needed when I was on right like a trip and in a hotel room. No, you didn't have much else going on. It was just like, I'm tired. I want you something that I don't have to think about even a little bit. I just will. Um, yeah, I want to. I want to know exactly when to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, tell me more. Tell I, me when to yeah, laugh. I can grab a couple of these guys. Yeah. Oh my god! Please destroy this trap. Horror spiders. You know, they're like, kind of, of scorpion it. They're like they look like double they, stingers. They look like they bathe in lava. These look a bit like Pokemon. Yeah, Second they do. Evolved stage. So it's like evil Pokemon. It's like as if Pokemon had like some sort of morality system built so into like it. The, the 800 Pokemon. They're just like I don't know another fucking scorpion thing. It's like EA Games oh, buys a Pokemon lost. franchise oh. and just yeah. <laughs> decides to. <laughs> Every year they just add another 100. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> has anything? Has there been any Pokemon stuff since Pokemon Go? Um, that's, that's a good question. I, I don't know. I don't think there has been actually. They're they're still trying to figure out what they're sitting on with Pokemon Go. Go, I believe. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, it, it seems like that. I guess. I know it was really big, and then it had a huge drop off. But I I guess it's like kind of working its way to its uh, equilibrium or something where. Now they have fewer users because it's like explosive popularity has worn off. But oh, by they the way, can focus on more dedicated users and try to make an experience that's yeah. Monetizable. By the way, I believe I just noticed you only have five um, tentacle monsters and five spider creatures. Yes, yeah, so let's build a bigger layer. I think I, I would humbly a suggest a bigger food Your area too. That is not enough attacked. food. Yeah, I would. You might want to build like a, a barracks, maybe. A cultist den? I don't know. A cultist, that's where they research spells, I think. Yeah, the library. All right, let's let's start with bigger. Yes. That's more food. You, you are the Monsanto of underground demon layers. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and a place for them to sleep. Yeah. Uh, uh, sleep these days. Um, and the barracks, as you said. Yes. How about the um, fallen claim? Well, yeah, you need to build it there. This will be a decent barracks. Uh, probably good. It's a good size. Yeah, they'll learn something. Yeah, something about combat or other. I don't know. Okay, what else can we build? You we can build. An archive. an archive is excellent. An excellent idea. Build it there. How about here? This will be a decently sized archive. Cool. Alright. Anyway. Um, so, uh, let's switch to my topic. I'm rapidly losing my ability to talk. Um, so I was going to talk a bit about Darkest Dungeon. Here, actually, why, why don't you take a shift on this? Ah, uh, okay. That will make it easier for me. Um, so, yeah. Your minions are in combat. Darkest Dungeon. Yes, that's why. Why is Darkest Dungeon even worth playing? Well, so Darkest Dungeon was a Kickstarter game from maybe. I don't, what was I doing here? You should slap away those ridiculous beacons. I yeah, I don't. I don't know what you're doing. This is like war for the overworld. For did I do that? I mean, you were in control. <laughs> yes, I think that must have. <laughs> we have the video evidence either way. We'll okay. be able to determine later. Oh, yeah, that's... I need a bar. <laughs> I need a fucking drink. <laughs> <laughs> Sent away a bunch of weird little yeah, Well, speaking things. of which, we seem to be out of the red wine. Would you like a Ranier, perhaps? Uh, that'd be Good. nice. Yeah. Oh, no. All right, I'll grab a couple of Raniers and then we'll talk about Darkest Dungeon. All right. And I'm oh. back with some lovely beer. Um, we should probably do something about this whole, like, violence in the dungeon thing. I think my creatures feel a little bit bullied. They feel maybe. a little overworked. Oh, yeah. Lost. I think I need. I've been lobbing fireballs all day, you fascist. I need to convince them to organize. Well, you built that bar. I did. I mean, it's my. 
It's my dungeon beer hall. This is where I will instigate my my Soviet you're the, socialist republic. You're the dungeon keeper that they hired after the union got involved. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're entitled to tavern breaks. <laughs> anyway, Darkest Dungeon. Uh, Darkest Dungeon has a tavern in it. Speaking oh, really? of. Yes, it does. So, I guess the, the premise of Darkest Dungeon, story-wise, is that, like, your family's estate has excavated the depths of hell and unleashed them upon Charming. the world. And you are coming to... Because, you know, that's like every family like goal. Yeah, I mean, if you call it an estate, there's a 60% chance that there's at least one portal to hell beneath it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of like what you get when you earn, like, millionaire status. You just, like, earn a portal to hell and, like, you're right. required Well, that's to the only way to get to millionaire status is to be comfortable with hell. Yeah, and you just, like, you're it, required to, like, gift it, gift it to your grandchildren upon your death for them to, like, mysteriously be left with to decide what... I don't know what to do with this. Anyway. And then be possessed. That's the, that's the hell strategy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's everywhere. <laughs> so, um, basically, you... It's a party-based game. You start with a crusader and a highwayman, but there's maybe, like... 16 classes or so yeah and a monstrous uh, beast you take four at a time to go the into these expeditions the into dungeon. the dungeon and and so it is a roguelike the dungeons are procedurally generated yeah and the cycle is sort of you go into the dungeon and there's usually a mission like clear all the room battles or explore 90% of the dungeon or find this item in, inside the dungeon, mm -hmm. defeat the boss, whatever. And in that way, it's like a fairly standard dungeon crawler, but it has this interesting affliction system where your you're, it sort of wanted to explore the idea of like, let's say you really were one of these adventurers who dives into a dungeon like this every week. Like what would that do to your mental health? And so- It would be rather destructive, I think. Right, so, you know, if your heroes are getting beat up and have been going into the dungeon week after week without um, taking time off and taking care of their health, they might get these afflictions like, you know, becoming irrational or masochistic or whatever, and it starts to affect the way they work with each other. So, if your the hero is, is fearful or paranoid, they might not accept healing from your healer because they're like convinced that they're trying to hurt them or something like that. Goodness gracious. Um, so it's really important to like take care of the well-being of your of your heroes. So do you need to hire a psych psychiatrist to accompany you into the dungeon? Well, so like you have 16 characters and you only take four into the dungeon at a time, right? So once you've done one expedition, you might leave them in town the next week and you can like leave them at the tavern or take them to the sanitarium. Ah, you know, this is like the strategy actually the British Army took um, <laughs> when what, what time fighting period? World War One. Nice. Because the trenches were actually fairly reminiscent of this environment. Right. It's, it's kind right. of like blasted wasteland. Bloated corpses and... And like the people you get to know end up being like dead the next day under some sort of like charge right well actually that's so that's interesting right? so i watched a couple talks by the developers of this so this was a kickstarter darling a couple years ago uh went through an early access period it, it's one of the examples sometimes you use of like early access done right yeah and uh and what they talked about was they wanted they actually got a lot of inspiration from like soldiers with P ptsd and they wanted to show some of those effects in a game and uh one thing that they talk about is like it's the sword arm, not the sword, and that like heroes are human, and Why like bravery doesn't exist without fear, together? and and in that way I think it does a really good job because you lose a lot of heroes. Well, actually, it, so it's a really hard game and it's a roguelike, and that's part of the reason I like it is it in some ways reminds Watch me of like mana. a fantasy fantasy setting FTL sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you spend a lot more time becoming personally invested in your heroes. So yeah. where, where in FTL it was like they were just these little unlocked. little tiny avatars. 
In this, you actually level your heroes and you collect equipment for them and stuff. And so, like, when you lose a hero that's been leveled up to, say, four out of six or something like that. And you, it's like a big loss. Yeah, you, like, actually feel feel pretty bad about that. Um, so it's a it's a pretty cool game in that. Ah, so it's like, it, it actually has a moral system without an explicit moral system. Yeah, yeah. It It's... I would say a subtly, a subtly deep game in terms you know, of that's its like, themes. That's like a really good implementation of a moral system. Something that makes you actually, you know, feel moral without requiring, like telling you feel moral, like laugh cues in a goddamn sitcom. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Aww. Well, yeah, like that's like a good example of something that implements yeah. Well, a moral and it, system well. You tend to. Uh, it, it because it's a roguelike and, and does that pretty well. You know, you feel bad in terms of like I thought that I could make it to the end of this dungeon, right? So like if you abandon a mission, you'll suffer a pretty big stress penalty. Yeah. And that's bad, but it's better than losing the hero. Yeah. And so a lot of the times you feel driven to push a little farther because you think you're gonna be okay, but then you die in the last room or something like that. Oh yeah. And and so in that way it just sort of like Weighs on you as the uh, the one calling went, the shots. I went too far. Yeah, I should have, I should have done. I should have listened. They said that they were fearful. Alas, I can just reload it. <laughs> yes, but you can't. Permadeath. Oh, that's right. Roguelike. That's the point. To make you regret. It's like real life, except yeah. not really. Well, in the, in the talk that the guy gave at GDC, one of the questions, he asked everyone in the audience who had played the game before but resolved to never play it again and raise their <laughs> hand. And he basically said, yeah, you know, that is the, the, our limitations as designers because we want it to be, like, masochistic, but we don't want it to be so masochistic that you put it down and never pick it up again. Yeah, that's kind of like the... Dark Souls mentality of game design. Yes, which personally I like. I definitely, I, I do like simpler games as we were discussing earlier. Oh, nice one. No, I just I scratched the side of my head and I hit the keyboard by accident. So, um, I, I like simpler games that are simpler in their design, but also generally harder. Yeah, so this is like kind of a weakness in the AI for this game. Is that the computer doesn't really recognize when traps exist. Yeah, I noticed that. But you can recognize when traps exist. So, there's a system visibility to you that isn't... A, there's a visibility to you that isn't visible to the system, which is like kind of strange to think about. Yeah. It, it allows you to take control, but it doesn't allow the computer to take control. Do you think that that is by design? I mean, it has to. Because, like, universally, game designers are trying to make the system available. They probably want to make it so that the the creatures don't just go and win the game for you. There are parts where you have to take an active role. True, but that sounds like a very arbitrary point for you to force the Right, because to it just makes you feel like, why? Why can't they see the trap? It's shooting at them. Yeah, as opposed to, like, literally anything else. Yeah. Like, if I can see it, why can't they see it? It's a very strange choice, and I don't know if there's like some sort of like technical debt reason, like the reasons for, for why creatures can't see traps but they can see other stuff is like literally is the difference between as one of the zero and the game turning on or turning off and they can't redo it without like rebuilding the entire goddamn game, yeah. but it seems like a thing that should be fixed, but alas. Yeah. Alas this, indeed. So, uh, I guess we should move on to talk about Into the Breach a little bit. Wait, what is Into the Breach? It's that game from the same studio that did FTL, and it is coming out on oh, the 27th. Oh, yeah! I remember that looking at all, like, um, Advance Wars, which is very curious, because I very enjoyed that game as a kid. Yeah, so I haven't played Advance Wars. Uh, uh, to me, it looks it's pretty wholly creative. You've it, an based on the trailers I've seen for it, and granted I haven't watched any gameplay, spirit. or I haven't watched much gameplay, yeah. it reminds me of something maybe like XCOM a little bit, 
but but it it's exciting to me precisely because I really don't know what kind of game it's going to end up being, but I, I do like that studio a lot. I, uh, from the look of it, it's going to be a nice way to spend a few hours. I'm like, having played Advanced Wars, like, it's a really good way to waste the time while you're in the car, waiting Underminer for your parents complete. to get to your grandparents' house in the on your, on your Game Boy. Yeah. And to save and wrap things up by the time you get to your grandparents' house. I, I wonder how roguelike it'll be. It... I don't know. I don't know, but... It seems likely that that studio would want to push that concept into a like, different kind of game. Yeah. It's an interesting balance because it seems like it has a story to it, but roguelikes well, don't I really think... mesh well with stories that well because it, it by, 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 so like by nature roguelikes are like procedurally generated right. and they're kind of opposed to the idea of like a curated storyline and so it requires jujitsu like game mechanic and game planning to make them mesh, mesh well. So, so what I would say is I think I think that in roguelikes do well not. with Story frameworks, right? You can align like general goals. You can basically that say that enemy one way to advance so is to trigger a story event, but you can't Construct you can't control as much when the player is going to encounter those things. Yeah, and so they they tend to work better with slightly looser stories. But I often think that that can work. That can almost work better in some cases because it kind of gives you a little more room for your little imagination to fill in the gaps. That's true. I do play Dungeons and Dragons, and it's... Dungeons and Dragons is fun because you never know what's coming. It's... oh, it's kind of like, in some ways, the ultimate RPG. Because, like, what you may be experiencing the... the night of will be different the night then. Right, well, and it, presumably it's, part of the experience the there is it's like... You have somebody that you actually know in real life who's your friend designing the experience for you. Yeah, and You've a I've heard of people like spending like two years planning their Dungeons and Dragons game. Oh my god. And that's all well and good, and I, I guess it's a certain style, but I feel like the best Dungeons and Dragons meetups are the ones where the Dungeon Master plans it two hours beforehand. Someone brings pizza, another person brings beer, and it's with, like fantasy improv for like two hours. That is less preparation than we did for this episode. Yeah, it's it's like people, it's a crowd of people getting drunk, eating pizza, and the saying like silly things to each other. For, I don't have pizza either. Yeah, yeah alas, a new it's a group activity. Oh, I did provide some Your some orange chicken. It was good. By an enemy. Slash orange chicken. An enemy has claimed your perception shrine. I guess I bought this. Yes. Anyway, into the breach. I'm pretty excited. I'm definitely like. Oh yes, yeah, into the breach. A new <laughs> yeah, remember we were talking about <laughs> games. Um, yeah, pretty excited. I haven't been playing many new games lately, but that's definitely one of the ones that I've been eagerly anticipating to launch for some time. Actually, another one... Is it anything like, um, that crazy monster game where, like, there's only, like, two monsters actually in the game, but you never know where the two monsters are until it fucking creeps up on you and you're like, HOLY SHIT, IT'S THE THING! This sounds like, uh... Amnesia? Yeah, Amnesia. No, I don't play those games. Um, I'm not opposed to them, but I haven't played them. Um, no, I don't think Into the Breach is anything like that. But I was going to say, um, the other Underline game that's coming out soon-ish that I'm kind of excited about is Sea of Thieves. Ooh, that sounds fancy. Well, it's a pirate game. I think I showed you the trailer for it a long time ago. It's got kind of like a cartoony Pirates oh, of the Caribbean vibe yeah. to it. Yeah, I, I kind of have like a lot of skepticism towards those kind of games. Are you worried it's going to be like a No Man's Sky? Yeah. Have nothing to do. Because sailing the seas is a very sexy concept and all, but I think inevitably it frequently ends up very disappointing because the reality of the sea is it's fairly boring. <laughs> it's boring until it murders you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what I really wish there was? Uh -huh. I really wish there was like a pirate, Pirates of the Caribbean-esque version of FTL. I think it'd be perfect for that. Yeah. You could have pirates and the navy and evil ghost ships and random encounters and. Yeah. I think it'd be cool. 
But uh, Sea of Thieves it, I so mean, far seems like it's reviewing pretty well in its open beta. Um, but it's a really multiplayer experience. It seems like it's uh, a lot about building a ship with your friends and that sort of thing. I really, I really dislike that because it becomes a very because you don't have any friends. Well, see, <laughs> <laughs> but really, I think the the reason. So the reason why I really dislike purely social games is the fact that it imposes like a legion esque aspect to the game. Like it becomes. You cannot be an individual. You are part. You are forever part of a community, and that's why I really dislike it because you can't have your own space, your own space to like do your own thing in a game and explore the game at your own pace. Yeah. You're imposed into the social space that has its own rules that are beyond your control, I mean, and it 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 feels very 1984-esque. Like you are, <laughs> like the rules are being imposed upon you. And oh, all right. don't you? Wouldn't you say that? Nobody's making you buy or play these social games, and so maybe comparing it to Orwell is just a little <laughs> much. <laughs> I mean, I've never been exaggerated. I'm accused of being exa exaggerating. <laughs> <laughs> no, not Ed. <laughs> not me. What, what did you say? Amadeus. That was how you introduced yourself. <laughs> I. But I still think there's a validity to that argument, because I think that. Preserving a sense of individual exploration and identity within play is very important to having an enjoyable game experience. Yeah. You if you play social way. games, you might as well have hacked into the DNC and thrown the election to Donald Trump. Oh. Fucking commie. Yeah. As my face transforms into <laughs> linen. <laughs> <laughs> you found me out! <laughs> Which is why we're playing this what did we do? Uh, Adam Adam Mills' Invisible Hand of the Market oh, game. We're good lost. patriotic Americans here. <laughs> Adam Smith. Adam Smith. Which is like Adam Mills. Adam, no. <laughs> the, 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 like, John Stuart Mills. <laughs> <laughs> the Frankenstein. Andre Stackhouse, expert philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> the Frankenstein reanimation. Yes, the philosopher we need. <laughs> Well, you're getting rather close to their dungeon heart. I do think that we've almost won the day here. Oh, wait. I feel like I did this incorrectly. Well, you're going kind of... Not the most direct way, but just just go left a little bit. Oh, we have the objectives over here. That was a thing. Wait, you have to... Oh. Build a warding... Well, no. Turn. Well, two of those are optional. Use an undermine and blast the brimstone. I feel right. like we did that. Did we do that? Well, we blasted brimstone. Brimstone. Oh, it's over here. Yes. There's a thing over here. Yes, that's what I've been saying. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I was confused. Anyway, I think maybe it's a good time to move on to Would You Rather. Are you ready for this? Oh, no. <laughs> Is, uh, would you I'm rather... Well, it's... Uh, <laughs> I'm not even intending to start. I'm already posing Would You Rathers. Okay, I'm going to read the first one. Okay. Now, All right. assume that our universe is a simulation. This was submitted by Christopher, by the way. Assume that our universe is a simulation contained with, within infinitely nested universe simulations. Would you rather push or pop the reality stack? And for all of you non-CS majors out there, it means would you rather go one deeper or would you rather take the red pill? Go one out of it. Man. So, I, if the red pill means some sort of like joining of like masochistic sexist society, yes. would you rather? I, I, th rather I think I think I would like rather not take the red pill and join the sexist society. And you'd rather be woke than red pilled. Um. Well, woke just also sounds like hmm. <laughs> disgusting. No, it I don't sounds like a different flavor of red pill. Perhaps. Yeah. Hmm. I'd I'd rather stay in limbo. All right. That's, well, my, that's my decision. I will not make a decision. Um, start the next level. Here's the question. It's time to kill Do you want to be the one stone. who answers this the question or elaborates on this situation? God, uh, I want to answer it. All right. So you as, are... as long as the as long as the options are like equally unpalatable. <laughs> well, we'll find out, won't we? You have to ask me. So it is time for you to ask me clarifying questions about this situation. Oh. 
Um, has been Vogue. Back to his Wait, what does Vogue mean? No, 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 not that situation. No. Oh. <laughs> Would you rather go one simulated reality deeper, so the simulation within the simulation, or go one out further towards reality? So, if I went out for towards reality... I'll learn um, more of the situation within it. What would... Is it going to be like a dream state? Is it going to be like the kind of halfway point between sleep and dream? So, so this is the situation, right? Be, no, I'd like, I like... I think this is like a genuine you question because I think like the experience of like being between dream and wake state is actually quite enjoyable. So if like if that's kind of where I'd be, I don't know. I think I would... I'd want to be... Like, no, don't answer this? yet. You are still asking questions. And I'm elaborating on the situation. Oh, so I have to ex fully explore. You have, you have to explore until I say that the question phase is done. Oh. And then you will answer. Well, see, so, I, I, so I'm what new is, to this. What is your first... Your first question is, will going one further out be like a midpoint between waking and sleeping state? Yeah. Okay, so imagine the state you're in right now. That's where we are. But that is inside a simulation. So it's going to get more realistic than it is right now so it's going to be closer to a waking state so it's like in the, the opposite the point like if you went in yes like what would unrealistic look like like how how can unrealistic be verified as like a concrete thing what would that what would that experience be like yes well, like i i know what realistic looks like but what is the what is Possess that chunder. Oh. But this is, is this is what it is like this one deeper. Reduces defense parts over time. Well, that's really Which your workers can use to build yes. more defenses. Um, more questions. Store up to eight parts <laughs> at once. Some I of walls were in the attack. I need to But you can use replacement earth to um, them up. Cast it now I, to fix oh the bridge. Gracious. So, if I went... Oh, I can't, uh, what are you trying to do right now? Move. I'm trying to move. Has the keyboard run out of batteries again? Is it looking orange? Oh, wait. I know what happened. Are you still possessing the same thing? I just... I am, like, Open not in control of my own destiny right now. No. Select Obviously not. We're not free. Um... Anyways, in regards to infinite realities, I... Not answering yet. Oh, oh, I can't answer it. You're still asking questions. I'm still asking questions. So, to that regard, so, like, one way is the Chunder view, and... That's one deeper. That's one deeper, and the other way is... Say it again. If you go out one further, it'll be more more waking. More, more waking. So, in the waking reality, yes. what what is that like? Turns out that in waking reality, you're a pretty famous person. You get stopped on the street. People want to take pictures with you. You're well off financially. nice. The ladies are really into you. Yeah. You've got it all. Oh, lovely. It's very nice. I, I... Still asking questions. Well... C can I be flexible with the ladies? Yeah, I mean, what, what do, do, you I, mean do I have to be stuck with ladies forever in um, this, unfortunately like... Unfortunately, you do. Oh... That's Only the ladies are into you. That sounds kind of damned. <laughs> but, I mean... You're invited to speak at conferences all the time. Well... Fame is nice, but I think Lady Gaga has explained at length... Ruined women for you? Well, I was going to say explained at length why the fame isn't great and, and all that. Your minions are under attack. But... More questions. So is the Chender lifestyle any good? Attracted it's, by the it's, you know what? Of your it's like... A good, honest, working-class lifestyle. You, you, you make it <sighs> roam these dungeons all day, but you get to go to the a tavern afterwards. You got other chunder friends. You uh, get to you keep a nice cut of the of the spies. booty Using that you that you take off the corpses of, of heroes. What if I don't care about the working life then lifestyle? Any units you wish to add. 
By clicking um, on them in your dungeon. What if you the in the Chunder state don't care about it? Yeah. Well, you know. Like, what if I'm a Chunder and I want more than my lot? Like, my, there, you, you, my lot. You know what? What if, what if I, 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 I rank... You need a nice, to a walk. A nice uh, By placing gay Chunder. You don't have to be stuck with the ladies. <laughs> um, they really get you. You, you know, you're, are you're still both chunders, that's true, but you're there for each other, and, uh, but, you know, you, you don't necessarily love your job, but every, every day you go to work, you just feel like your, your prospects are a little bit brighter. So, I mean, can I network with other chunders? Can I... Yeah, can yeah I, you've got a whole professional network of chunders. You know, yeah. you hear word about other dungeons that you might work in. Yeah, I can like create a chunder union. I can like. Well, well let's not get carried away. I mean, <laughs> this is a universe run by uh, Adam Mills. Your minions are the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Unionism is forever banned. <laughs> you get slapped every once in a while. I mean, that happens. Ah, uh. that's that's part of the chunder lifestyle, I'm afraid. Okay, there's an HR. There's a there's a secret HR department somewhere that prevents any sort of unionism. Yeah. Any other questions, or would you like to wrap this round up? Um, I think I, I would wrap this up. All right, let's let's hear. How is Ed going to? Which would you rather? Chunders are disgusting. I think I would go for the ladies. All right, Ed's willing to switch teams if he doesn't have to be a chunder. Yeah, if I don't be a pile of goddamn vomit. All right, all right. I think you are going to direct the next one. Okay. All right, I don't actually know how good this one is, but we'll give it a try. It is, would you rather tell the truth or do a dare? Now so, continue to build the the I will right. be asking questions, you will be elaborating. Are you prepared for that? Me asking questions. No, me asking questions, you are providing the answers. Ah, uh, okay. I, 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 I think so. You think so? Can you do that while playing, or should we switch? I think we should switch. All right, I'm gonna like take the wheel. You take the wheel. Uh, all right. So let's. Before we get too far into this, I do want to figure out what exactly I'm trying to do. Bad, good guys over here. Yeah. Um. Eventually, you're gonna have to like create a bridge over there. Um. On all honesty, I wasn't entirely aware of what I was doing. So you may be inheriting a mess of a dungeon. Well. Perhaps if there was a union, you would have done higher quality work. Yeah, not all of us can be like 100% efficient capitalist society. Yeah, some of us are parasites. Yeah, some of us have to like start a union to like be efficient. All right, so now I'm going to ask you questions about this truth or dare scenario. Yeah. And the first question I have is, um, uh. Who am I playing Truth or Dare with? Um, a shadowed figure. A shadowed figure, okay. Uh, is it safe to assume I don't know this person? Um, you have an inkling you might have met this figure in the past, but you Ooh. can't quite place where. Okay, okay. Um, and which would they rather ask? Which would they rather have me do? You have discovered a gate. Um, you feel like it's completely 50-50 and whether or not they would receive one answer well or badly. All right, so basically that's up in the air. Um, if I go with dare, what, what are the consequences of not, like, do I have to do it or can I choose not to do it with consequences or, um, or can I just like walk away? Um, you have yet to find out what the consequences are, but you feel as though there, there's a decent chance that something interesting might happen. Okay, do I... Interesting to who you don't know yet. Okay, so is it possible I'll be Your rewarded for taking a dare or telling the truth? It, or is, it is completely possible. I might be rewarded, okay. Um, which one has a higher chance of reward, truth or dare? Your votes are full um, it feels kind of like a gamble of a lifetime, as though you were promised great great promise but they're also, like so there also might be consequences though, there right? also might be severe consequences and it's like we don't know we don't know it's an it's an equal chance on consequence versus yeah. reward okay um it's, it's regarding the truth uh, are there any 
Are there any legal figures present? Um, no. You are on your own. Oh. So this is just between me and this, sh this shadowy figure. Yeah. You are mm -hmm. beyond the legal system. All right, then. Um, since, the, you know, the legal system is a construct of an organized society. Is there an organized society in this? No, you, you're, only, you're only with the, the shadowed figure. So there's no organized society in the world? Um, at your current reach. At my current reach. So <laughs> we're living in, like, one of those post-apocalyptic ones where we hear rumors that there might be a civilized society. <laughs> but... <laughs> In the, in the current situation, yes. It, the All right, civilized so society is being your reach. Basically, it's the walking dead. This is a shadowy figure. Uh, that, that doesn't make me feel very good about this figure. You need a larger um, vault. Let's see. Uh, well, so... Have I done anything that I would consider... Overly... Are under compromising or embarrassing or... Uh, that would make me vulnerable? I mean, as you say, it's The Walking Dead. I mean, he might have been spying yeah. anywhere. I might have, like, killed my wife or something. Yeah. The moral system doesn't exist as, like, a uniform thing anymore. Okay. As I said, legal system is out of your reach. You, you are a system unto yourself. Okay. And... Let's see... Your minions are under attack! Where am I being attacked? And this looks like... What do you think this thing is? That's like a little relic thing. Yeah. Okay. A cultist is unhappy because it is tired. That's cultist you. Lost. No, that's your chunder boyfriend. Even worse. Okay. Back to truth or dare. Um, I want to know... If Your anyone will find combat. out about this dare that I potentially do, if I do it, uh, is that something that like my friends or family might know about someday? Could. They could. They could. Okay, you're answering a lot of these questions ambiguously. I know. Yes. A life takes. Life requires a nam like a gamble at some point. Well, then I feel like I have very little information with which to answer this. Your I, vaults I, cannot store any more gold. Oh, okay, let's, let's build another gold room for our capitalist parado uh, paradise. <laughs> capitalist paradox. <laughs> <laughs> no, those don't exist. Capitalism is perfect. <laughs> if you're listening, NSA, I'm, I'm a patriotic American. <laughs> Do you, are you? Do you feel ready to answer my my elaborated questions? Yeah, I mean, I I guess it's any man's game, so I'll just go with. Uh, I think I'd like to do a dare. What what does he dare me to do? Do you know? Um, he dares you to give a warm hug. Nice. And do I get rewarded or punished for this? Yes. Which one? You have to find out. Um, I, okay. I thought I thought I just answered. Uh, so, I give this figure a hug, and... You're the swaggiest, dankest the underlord I swaggiest, know. dankest. Oof. Oof. I could be a little danker, if I'm being perfectly honest. Oh, a punishment or reward? Yeah, you do get a punishment. I get a punishment, but so what is it? Uh, been, I, so, he forces me to hug him, and then I'm punished. Yeah, uh, a stern, a fr stern frown. A stern frown. Okay, well, it's it's a low stakes surprise. Yeah, <laughs> all things considered, I guess that could have been worse. I was hoping, I was hoping to be rewarded, but I just get mildly chastised. All right, and our third one, by the way, that but that was submitted by Chris, and this is also submitted by Chris. I think this is gonna be a good one. Would you rather live in a world of no public bathrooms or no private bathrooms? The floor is open for questions, Ed. Um, what would be the social environment of the public bathrooms? Where there's no public bathrooms? Where there's no private bathrooms. Where there's no private bathrooms. Well, it's just anytime you go to the bathroom, you go to a public one. You, you know, in many ways it's bad because, um, you know, you have to take care of all of that in front of people. Um, and unfortunately, by public, I, 
I do mean that they're not even enclosed. No. It is just everybody has to do this just with everything hanging out. But socially, it's it's uh it's a bit of a mixed bag, you know. There's there's a lot of strangers there. Every once in a while, you run into like that person that you normally avoid eye contact with. But every once in a while, you you run into um you know you run into your buddy and you just chat it up a little bit while you both let it hang out and take care of your business. Yeah. So so socially. It's actually, it, it, in fact, a few studies have even come out that empirically show that this has built social cohesion. Interesting. So, would there be any sort of sexual culture around these public bathrooms? So there's, there's different ranges of public bathrooms. Some of them are like a no, no sexual content bathroom and others are like you go there because you you want to see what other people are going to the bathroom and just hoping to hoping to meet somebody yeah so there'll be, there'll yeah. be conservative bathrooms and liberal bathrooms that's that is correct there's uh you know you got your bar bathrooms and your church bathrooms uh i see mm, some of them might have like sacraments and such but might require you know they've got a bathroom for every everything you could think of so these bathrooms will be a... There's some that like, I, we're not even going to talk about. Very depraved bathrooms. Let's see, religious bathrooms. Now, I think more depraved. Oh, okay. Well, okay. But again, we're, we weren't, we're not going to go there. Depraved religion. <laughs> <laughs> not going to go there. <laughs> um, okay, what are what is um, the world like with no... No private bathrooms, or no public bathrooms, rather. Yeah, with no public bathrooms. So in the world with no public bathrooms, um, first of all, sanitation, way Your better. Everybody has a private bathroom. Enemy. Yeah. There's, there's no, like, there's still a homelessness problem, but they all have their own bathroom. I see. Yeah. And... Is it going to be like a, an apartheid state where the homeless have like their separate bathrooms? And they, all, they all have their own private bathrooms. But is it still an apartheid state where a homeless person one is required to use this bathroom and homeless person two is required to use Well, this yes, bathroom? no, there's no public bathroom. You can only use your own. Ah, so it, was, it is an individual apartheid state. The ultimate conclusion of capitalism Sure. <laughs> I don't know what it means for there to be an apartheid of one. But <laughs> um, but but better than that, everybody gets like their own like Jeevesy Butler in the bathroom. Ooh, that's nice. Um, what is Jeeves like? Well, he's, he's incredibly polite. He never asks a question that's too personal. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you do have to pay him. And that, that's like in the form of a tax. You have to pay Jeeves taxes. Ooh. But, you so, know. So there's, there's an enforced state that requires you to put, pay Jeeves. Well, it's the same as the apartheid state, you know. That's the, the private bathroom thing is enforced, I'm afraid. So Jeeves is the state. An you pay Jeeves. <laughs> he's a government employee. He's Jeeves is the only employee. He's unionized. But you you pay Jeeves a tax for our services, and so Jeeves is the state of Your creatures <laughs> are in combat. no public bathroom environment. It's like state of Jeeves. Yes, but... It's, it's actually one of the most popular government services there is. Every once in a while, the Republicans will get into office and talk about cutting, cutting the Jeeves program, and reliably, it pulls. 80% of, of people support the, uh, is, the public Jeeves program. Is Jeeves an AI? Um, you know, if you're rich, Jeeves is an AI. Uh, if, you're, if you're like upper middle class, you have to deal with a, a less competent human Jeeves. Yeah. Um, and if you're, you know, lower working class, Jeeves is just, uh, you know, think of like 
the surliest DMV again. employee you ever had to yeah. had to deal with, but but you know they're still there. They get the job done eventually. Ah, so is there any political organization amongst the Jeeves? No, the Jeeves are are completely. They they don't need a lobby because they're that popular. Just of ah. their own merit. Overall. So, but but there, there could be the potential of unionization issues. No, they're union. They're already union. Ah, so they're, they're already part of the Soviet Socialist Union. Yes, but sort of different because the socialists would want everybody to use the public bathrooms, right? Hmm. Hmm. So now that I think, right, <laughs> right. So we have <laughs> private bathrooms that are enforced by the state. The other ones, so this is a, a, situa a little caveat about the other situation I should mention. Everybody has to use public bathrooms, but they're actually privately owned. You can't own one individually, but that, that is a privatized industry. Ah, the state is fully embracing the libertarian lifestyle. Yes. These are very different worlds. Ah, lost. No privacy, utter... <laughs> They're, they're no highly stay. surveilled, if I'm being honest. They, they, they actually monetize your bathroom data. Mm. This is like John Block, like legion of state. Was John Locke a huge statist? Yes. Hmm. He was, actually. Um, what? what I, no, Russo wasn't a statist. I, I think it was John Locke that was like the one aspiring to a giant state, but if, uh, maybe the other way around, the guy I'm thinking of is, I forget. No. Hobbes? Yeah, Hobbes is the one. Uh, Hobbes is the one that advocated for the... Yeah, because I thought Locke was like fairly big on individual liberties and... Yeah, Hobbes was the one that advocated natural, for... Natural rights. Yeah, Hobbes was the one that advocated for... Because he thought that like, we, you can't, we can't be trusted with all that freedom, we need a a big old state to keep us in line. Yes, so, um, which one is Hobbes in charge of? <laughs> well, you, you are assuming a little bit, but since you ask Hobbes is in charge of the, uh, the privately owned public bathrooms. So would it follow that Locke is in charge of the, the, the contrary, the other one? Well, it's actually, um, uh, John Maynard Keynes. Ah! So are they at odds? Are they aware of each other? They're different universes, but there are portals between them, and uh, there is a an ever-winding interdimensional struggle between the two worlds, and you're about to Can say which side you're on. Go? Is there potential for a big name movie to be made about these about this climatic issue? Only if we survive. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is more likely to win? I can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's very unfortunate. <laughs> it might depend on my answer. <laughs> I want to know if Question the Question and answer se section is over. <laughs> it's time to choose. <laughs> I, I think I want to be on the side the of cannot the... Its needs because it is rallied. State imposed libertarians. <laughs> no. Wait, so you want to be in the Hobbes young one? I think it's hilarious. You require clarification. <laughs> well, it's not state imposed. It was supposed to be completely privatized, right? Yeah, so I'm glad you like picked up on which one I was going for. All right, well, I would like you all to just take that little bit of information and then spend some time inferring who who Ed voted for. The state imposed libertarian society. <laughs> cannot satisfy its needs because it is rallied. Well, it turns out we're well over an hour twenty, and I don't really even know what our goal is with this dungeon. I guess it looks like we're close. It probably has something to do with these two bright yes. glowing lights. You're supposed to slaughter some shit. Yes. But I don't think anyone cares. So it might be time to wrap this up. It might be time. Anything you want to leave our viewers with before we uh before we call it a day. Um, I genuinely think the statist libertarian approach is a valid, um, John Hobbes, you know, 
Well, you should have chosen... I don't even remember if you chose going one deeper or one you further out. But clearly you want to live in this invisible, slappy hand world. So <laughs> enjoy <laughs> enjoy the poor design decisions of Peter Molyneux. Uh, all right. Paradise. Anyway, bye, viewers.